Enrichment, Enlightenment, Transformation. Rabbi Yisroel Cutler, the spiritual leader of Chabad of Cary, North Carolina, guides anyone who has been searching for a meaningful life and conscious living. Join our discussions about the mundane, our daily activities, and then infuse every day with a spiritual twist from the inspired sages of the Talmud and Jewish mysticism, which many call Kabbalah. We learn from the root source of all religious monotheistic traditions and delve into the symbolism and levels of meaning from biblical stories. For joining as well as those that are tuning into the live stream. And if you are tuning in, we, we would love to hear from you. You know, put in the chat box, ask questions. Any questions that you do ask will be featured as part of the program today. And uh, thanks, Amnon, Amnon, uh, NissanCommunications.com for hosting our stream. We deeply appreciate your making this class available to the entire world. And you're welcome. And Debbie is in the chat. Debbie, we hear you loud and clear. <laughs> we feel your presence here. Beautiful. Today's class is going to be about difficult children. Anyone have? Not all at once. Not all at once. They never. Some of us have been to difficult children. Some have. Some know people that have. And there's a, a powerful lesson to learn from Isaac Yitzchak, the second of the patriarchs, as to what he does. And although the story is a sad one, besides for what happens at the end of the story. There's a lot we learn from how he dealt with his son. Let's just backtrack. We have Abraham and Sarah. At an old age, they give birth to Isaac. In last week's Torah portion, Isaac marries his wife, and that is Rivka, Rebecca. And the Torah portion this week is Rebecca finally having, um, being, becoming pregnant and having twins in her womb. One of them is going to be Yaakov, Esau, uh, Yaakov, Jacob, and the other one is going to be Esau, Esau. So what I find interesting is from the beginning, before we even get into the text, is Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel were all barren at the beginning. It's very interesting. Isn't it interesting how all the mice, all our matriarchs, with the exception of Leah, were, were barren and for many years, could not have children? interesting and then when they go to menopause it's all good and then yeah then they have right then they have a late a late kind of revival later on but it's interesting how it's not just sarah we spoke about sarah's struggles it's really all of them perhaps the lesson is how we are supposed to view every child as a miracle and a right blessing. and a blessing not take children for granted I, maybe maybe that is one perspective maybe it's to teach us the power of prayer i don't know but whatever you, you can't miss it you can't miss the fact that all three of them are barren. And that's got to be for a reason. Yeah, Pam? Well, I think I read somewhere that if um, it actually had three more children after those two. Abraham did. Yeah. Abraham, after his wife Sarah passes away, he remarries the first wife, Hagar, who we spoke about a few weeks ago. Yes. Remember, Hagar had Ishmael. Right. They give birth again to many other children. We have a few other children. Abraham doesn't slow down. He keeps on going. And it mentions in last week's Torah portion, I wasn't here, but it mentions at the end that before he passes away, his other children travel to the east and just Yitzchak, Isaac, stays local. Rabbi. And what's interesting, I just want to finish, it says that the children that went east, he gave them gifts. It's very interesting. The Torah doesn't normally mention, you know, what they gave for, for, for their birthday or mothers. It says he sent them east and gave them gifts. The Midrash writes, what kind of gifts were these? Spiritual gifts. Hmm. And so many of the Eastern traditions until today, all the spirituality that's found in the Far East has its roots in an Abrahamic tradition in Judaism. And that's why whenever people tell me, oh, I see similarities between some of these traditions in the Far East and Judaism, that's the, that's, that's the Kabbalah's answer to that, actually. Far East, far, it says he sent them East. Don't give in to my Thursday night teaching. 
the blue guy. Oh, I'm not yeah. saying yeah. that it's kosher for a Jew to study. I'm saying there are similarities between the two. Yeah. The blue guy, who I forget who he is, that Hindu, that's blue. Uh, you know, and it's, it's very interesting. By the way, uh, this is all parenthetical. It says one of the kids that, one of the grandkids he has, his name is Ashurim. You know what word that sounds like? Ashram. An ashram. ashram yeah. Right? That's, yeah. that's pretty interesting. Um, even um, Abraham sounds very similar to the word Brahmin, which if, is uh, one of the deities. What is that? A priest, it? So it is interesting how there are similarities. That's not the point of, of the class today, but he did have these other children, but he puts his but attention and ask. focus into Yishmael quickly. And okay, you know what, where it says he had concubine. Are these like children that he had when he was still married mm -hmm. to Sarah? But how can they be concubine children? If he so so no, it, 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 he properly married Hagar after Sarah passed mm -hmm. away. She was a real wife. But she was why a real wife. They call concubine children. Uvene, Pila. While, so I would say that, you know, this is a little off. Let's not do that now. No, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a. All right. And I guess I have to look up Rashi, but I'm <laughs> over my head. Because you're right. Why would it call a concubine if he properly married her? It's a good question. Or I thought maybe it. he had other children. Maybe no, it was all from this one. It was all from this after one. After the marriage. Correct. And he remarried properly, Rashi tells us, this way. Let us go to the next generation. Isaac. Isaac can have children for many years. Text 1A, Marty. Begin, please. And Isaac prayed to God opposite his wife because she was barren. And God accepted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I like this? And she went to inquire of God. So she didn't know why she was having such a rough pregnancy. And she felt, as we'll see in a moment, a struggle inside of her. And she says, what's going on over here? She went to inquire of God. How does one do that? Well, if there's prophets around, you go ask the local prophet. Well, you might ask a simple question, you know, why look elsewhere? Why not ask, uh, maybe ask her father-in-law, Abraham? So she wanted some objective <laughs> advice out of the family. Let's leave this one out of the family. So what's interesting, and I never knew this until now, the answer that she gets, she may not have even shared with her own husband. I never realized that. Who is the prophet? So there is a old prophet that is still around from, from years earlier, one of Noah's children. The righteous child of Noah, his name is Shem. He was a prophet. He had a very close connection with God. She goes, asks great great granddad. Right, isn't that Abraham's great great correct, granddad? Correct, correct. And he's still around? He's still around. Remember, they, they, they lived these remarkable lives. Remember, the, the, the short lifespans began really in Abraham's generation. So she went to go ask, and let's the, let's now do Midrash text one one B Bill. Yeah, our rabbis interpreted the word <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as an expression of running. Good. When Rebecca passed by the entrances of the Torah academies of Shem and Eber, Jacob would run and struggle to come out. When she passed the entrance of the table, temple of idolatry, Esau would run and struggle to come out. So she was feeling something very odd going on inside of her, this struggle even in womb of the two children. Keep on winning. Reading, and she went to inquire to the academy of shame. of shame. She went to shame to say, "What is going on? I've never heard of a pregnancy this odd." Where even in womb, we have this struggle taking place, and it is shame. Then, when the verse now we're we're going back to what God answers her, but the way the rabbis are understanding that is is through this prophecy text two a. Do you mind continuing? Yeah, and God said to her, two nations are in your womb and two kingdoms will separate from your enemies. And one kingdom will become mightier than the other kingdom and the elder will serve the younger. So she is told you have two kingdoms. This is huge. What's going on inside of you is going to be something of global proportions. You're going to have twins. Um, let's skip text to B. But she is told from the beginning that ultimately the younger will serve the older. Now, had she shared that the, the younger will serve, oh, the older will serve the younger. Right. 
Had she shared this information with Isaac, that's why I never realized she may not have shared it with him. And perhaps that is what caused some of these challenges. She doesn't share that information with her husband. She keeps it quiet. Why? I don't know. Maybe she just wanted to let things play out. Maybe wanted Isaac to treat them normally. You know, it's like the teacher. There, there's some teachers I know that they don't want to tell next year's teacher when the kids, you know, what the kids, let them have a fresh start. You know, why should Isaac from the get-go know that this one's rebel, this one's rebellious and this one's righteous? Let him treat them both the same. She does not tell. Okay. The verses continue. The boys grow up. He uses an interesting expression. Um, the boys grow up. Text 3a. And why don't you, sorry, what was your first name again? I forgot. Sandy. I'm, I'm not reading. Yet. Not reading. Okay. Pass it on to your wife. Just Three. audio. Just audio. Just audio. 3A. And the youth grew up, and Esau was a man who understood hunting, a man of the field, whereas Jacob was an innocent man dwelling in the tents of Jordan. Okay, so the, this is not Midrash. This is the verse. The verse says Esau was a man who understood hunting. Where did he live? Yaakov was a man who is Tom. Tom means sincere or innocent, and he dwelled in tents. That is an expression found throughout Torah. Like, how goodly are your tents? What is it a reference to? Tents of Torah. So the verses tell us from the get-go that Yaakov spent his time studying. Esav spent his time hunting. Okay, questions? It's interesting, I, I, because we have so many texts today, I just want to skip, but but hunting was always seen as such an un-Jewish thing to do. You know, I, 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 are there any specific violations there? Maybe cruelty to animals? But but the whole idea of making a sport out of, out of it, it just, it's just so not Jewish. Even so... Um, but nevertheless, but, nevertheless... Um, um, I'm trying to say, Yitzhak um, craved for game. Correct, correct. And that is for food purposes. So if it's for food purposes, that's different than for sport. Yeah, yeah. So, so I wanted to come back to that. Yeah. We're talking about sport um, in this verse. And, and do we have any evidence that sport hunting as opposed to hunting for food? Interesting. I mean, I mean he's not a shepherd. Correct. But, but God did say that, that, you know, that we... You're allowed to meet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That expression under... Yeah, I guess... Understood hunting. The problem was well, is, is he was, Right. And we're going to say that, you're right. We're going to say the Midrash writes you're hunting. The there's also a lot of deception involved. Um, text four is interesting. I, I, this is just parenthetical, but it's it just trying to show the Jewish perspective on hunting. So this is a text from the 1700s where there's a rabbi was asked by someone, am I allowed to go hunting? And he says that it's a little bit dangerous because you're out there with the wildlife. Am I allowed to do it? Or am I putting my life in risk? And the rabbi answers, you can read it to yourself, I'm surprised by the premise itself. The only people in the Torah that understood hunting, Nimrod and Esau. So you're not putting yourself in good company by hunting. If you want to know what the Torah says about hunting, those are the people in the Torah that hunting, hunting is not the way of the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How can a Jewish person kill a living creature for no purpose? But again, Brian, no purpose is different than doing it for a purpose. Of course. Correct. Okay. So the Torah tells us this identity of both of them. The years go on. Debbie, Debbie has a question. Sure. Uh, she says, what about proper kosher animal slaughter? Can we eat animals that have been hunted? And she said, to live, we must eat. Correct. So that would have been another reason why Jews traditionally would not have hunted, even if it was for food, because a bow and arrow can't shecht, can't properly slaughter. Now, could you trap an animal and then afterwards slaughter it? Yes. But generally, Jews would not have hunted for food because it would not enable you to properly slaughter the animal. Uh, you never, you ask what happens in an instance where there was absolutely no other food available and you were starving and in the wilderness? That obviously is a different, different story. In a case where one's life is in danger, we know that one is allowed to eat not kosher food. But generally speaking, Jews don't hunt even for food. The exception, of course, is fishing, 
because fish do not have to be shechted. Jews can catch fish the same way anyone catch fish. What yeah. about the animals were sacrificed in the temple? They were also shechted first. Always shechted, but not how hunted. Were they, how were they caught? Oh, you can catch, I mean. How were they, were they hunted? They're domesticated they, animals. They're, they're, they're mostly domesticated. Oh, very good point. All the animals shechted in the temple were domesticated animals. Very few wild animals are kosher. A deer would be an exception. A deer is one of the few wild animals that is kosher. Perhaps that is why it's kind of hard to find kosher deer. It's not venison. is Because, again, to, to get, you know, you got to catch it. That's interesting. What other wild animals I'm trying to think are kosher? Giraffe. Right. But technically speaking, no one eats it. I, as a child, I was told the myth... You never eat giraffe because the neck is too long and they don't know where to shecht it from. That's not true. That's not true. The answer is it's just not practical to shecht a giraffe. I don't think anyone eats giraffe. Is giraffe meat eat any? <laughs> the turkey also is. Oh, okay. Turkey. That's true. That's true. Turkeys are wild. They're found in the wild. But they're a little bit easier to catch than, than, than deer. Okay. Debbie's saying, uh, what about buffalo? We eat buffalo. They are herded. Mm. Okay. You can have, yeah, bison can be kosher. So you do have some other wild animals. They have to be caught. Um, yeah. In any event, let's, let's go further. The story continues. Yitzchak and Rivka get older. They're thinking about the future. There are two children. And again, we have this idea that one of them is going to carry on the tradition. Um, and here we have the difference between Yitzchak and and Rivka. If you want to know when in this story it happened, it happens later in Isaac's life. He's 123 years old when this story happens. And it says in the Torah, there's a Midrash that says when you get to the age of when your parents pass away, that should be a time in life where you start thinking about putting your affairs in order. I guess even before genes, right? Mm -hmm. If my parents passed away at this age, perhaps this is a time I should take life seriously. Sarah passed away at what age? I don't remember. 127. 127. She's within five. Uh, he's within five years of when his mother passes away. So he's starting to think about the future. And text five is where all the drama begins. One of the most dramatic scenes in the Torah. Pam? I think that's when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see and his elder son. And he said to him, my son. And he said to him, here I am. And he said, Behold, now I have grown old, I do not know the day of my death. So now sharpen your implements, your sword, and take your bow and go forth to the field and hunt game for me. And make for me tasty foods as I like, and bring them to me, and I'll eat in order that my soul will bless you before I die. Okay. Anyone that took the, the JLI remembers who was the person who prayed to God that he should have a better idea of when he's going to pass away so he can put his affairs in order. First JLI. Remember, Abraham prayed for he should look old. Oh, we did this in second JLI. Jacob prayed that he should feel old and have a sense of when he was going to pass away. And that's why much later in the Torah, before Jacob passes away, it says he was ill. I wonder if this is why he prayed for it. He saw what happened with his father when he wasn't sure when he was going to die and all this drama. Jacob prayed for signs that he was going to die. Jacob prayed for an illness that would precede death. For another conversation, but it's interesting. Isaac says, I don't know when I'm going to die. And he wants to bless his son Esau. What is he blessing him with? To continue the tradition of Judaism. And here's our question. Did he not know that Yaakov, that Jason, Jacob was the one who was innocent, who lived in tents, who studied Torah, who was righteous? Did he not know that Esau was a wild individual? Again, the Midrash writes that he was a murderer as well, a good for nothing. He hunted, he was wild. He just... Why did he believe? that Asa would be the proper recipient for this bracha. Well, he didn't have to believe he was trapped in tradition. 
So tradition was the oldest, so he didn't necessarily have to believe it, but he okay. could have been stuck in the... Okay. Right. And I think that was the difference between he and um, uh, Sarah. Okay. Um, uh, she, she saw through... Oh, you mean Rachel? Uh, Rebecca. Rebecca. Rebecca, Rebecca right uh, uh, she, yeah. she saw... Uh, and had the earlier so you're saying two different answers. You are saying maybe Jacob, excuse me, Isaac did not know. Rebecca did know. You are saying... Tradition says the older gets it, the older is going to well, get no, no, it. No, I'm agreeing with the first okay. argument, and that Isaac couldn't see past that. But as it's not uncommon, the wife could see better. The intuition of the wife helps out over here. Intuition. Good, she good. Was warned. Oh, very good. She was warned. She had she had this prophecy yeah. from above. Yeah. Okay. And again, I, until I was preparing for this class, I never had realized that she didn't share that with her husband. Right. How? He, Remember, <clears throat> he said that my soul, that that my soul blessed you. So spiritually, I'm reading it that Isaac wanted Esau to turn. Mm. He wanted Esau to receive part of his soul to turn. But when it came to the actual blessing, you materially blessed. You as a human give the blessing. Your soul doesn't give the blessing. So he knew who to bless. Interesting. And we're going to touch upon that later, him seeing the soul, so to speak. His soul, seeing the soul of his son. Yeah, Judy. Uh, Abraham also, um, he had an older son that, that was wild and he didn't, you know, he was hoping, he was praying. To that he would be a mensch. That he would be a mensch. That's true. And so um, Isaac, who was also blind, why wouldn't he... You know, want his older son to be a mensch. Okay, so these are all good perspectives. But why would a father not know his son? Correct. But it's not that. It's that he saw the soul, like like Hall, Hall said. He's saying he saw potential. He saw, no, he saw it by the time that he didn't have a vision and all that deception went on. But maybe because it was close to his death that he saw the soul of the righteous one. But wouldn't you know your child, <laughs> whether you're blind, deaf, or dumb? Wouldn't you know your own child? How could I think Reasonably speaking, I think you can stubborn, trick one. Stubbornly stuck I mean, you know, there's some right. You know everything. About Tammy, were you going to ask again? I was just going to say, from a parent's point of view, sometimes the neediest child gets the most attention. Yeah, it's in there. Most, uh, yeah, it's very, it's interesting. You know, uh, from doing friendship circle and dealing with a lot of families that have children with special needs, sometimes one of the challenges are the others in the family because. Up so mm -hmm. They take up so much, and exactly. And maybe we also hope that by giving this blessing to the older one, the older one will change. So there's a lot of beautiful perspectives here. We will see what all the traditions say. What Marty said, very simple, is going to be Nachmanides, Ramban, often very straight and dirty. He's often a simple shot. I think you you and Ramban, I think, <laughs> would see each other eye to eye. Where are we up to in the reading? Brian, text 7, 7. He intended to bless him to merit the blessing of Abraham to inherit the land and to be the bearer of the covenant with God because he was the firstborn. That's all. A Barbanel who lives 1400s, he says something more critical about Isaac, and he says, hey, he missed out on this. Brian, why didn't you do that one as well? There is no doubt that Isaac should have paid attention to Esau's behavior, his wickedness, the wickedness of his wife, and that their children would emulate their wicked ways. He should have prayed to God that he should know whom to bless, the one greater in age or the one greater in stature. However, law corrupts the proper order, and out of his love for Esau, he saw nothing wrong for him. So what's he saying? You know what, you, your love can blind you. Right. I mean, yeah, and again, remember, he, he, his son brought him a lot of food and respected him and didn't see it's false. Right. You know, and, and, and he continues really quickly uh, uh, before we do 8b. Perhaps the reason we're told that his eyes were dim is not just a physical blindness, but blinded. he was blinded by his faults because he did not notice, he did not contemplate his conduct as he should have. So his physical blindness, his emotional blindness, mm -hmm. all this factored into the equation. And you were going to say something. You know, just with once again, Rebecca tricking i mean isn't that trickery why couldn't they just have a little chat why didn't they just sit down <laughs> with a cup of coffee and say don't you see him and not only that can you help me with him he needs a whipping 
the original Jewish mother. <laughs> yeah, you already get dad to do the bad stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe she wanted to pick the blanket. What were you what were you gonna say? I was gonna ask whether the you know, this is my our first experience holding the, the bag. So yeah. I'm wondering whether these characters in the Bible are ever painted so black and white, or whether you couldn't see Esau as a blended character. I mean he was kind to his father, he did what his father requested, he brought the taste of his game to him. He did he made the recipe, he cooked it all up for him, he served it to him. Did, you know. We're gonna. We're actually. That's gonna be the Reb. The Reb is gonna head in that direction. Actually, what you just what you just said. But Asa wasn't a one dimensional character, and we're actually. It's a beautiful perspective. We're we're gonna go there right now. The fact that you're right. We can't ignore the mitzvahs that Asa did do. Maybe that's telling us something about him. You know, absolutely. Another thing about the way in Chabad is, is how you know what the Abarbanel just wrote. That, you know, he, he just didn't notice his sins and he was blinded by it. Usually in Chabad tradition, although we do believe that the patriarchs, again, they're not angels and we are, everyone makes mistakes and the characters in the Torah are humans, right? Nonetheless, we have to realize these are tzaddikim. These are righteous people of the highest levels. So to analyze it just from our limited perspective in our little world today and say, ah, he must have not realized his mistakes. Usually in Chabad tradition, we don't quickly do that when we're dealing with people of the likes of Ram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. There is so much more to the story. It, so to leave with an answer of the Abarbanel, the Rebbe usually wouldn't do. Just to say, eh, he liked the food, so therefore he didn't... Re As you said, it was his child. He was a tzaddik. There must be something more than him just not noticing yeah, the food. Yeah, that's the lunch that we Exactly. Bonding. Exactly. Um, and by the way, the Medrash writes that Asaph didn't just feed him, but Asaph did a very good job of tricking his father. And that's why for hunting in Hebrew, Sayyid means both hunting, but it also means deception. And when it says his hunting was in his mouth, what it means is he deceived him. And look at the way the Midrash writes it, text. Nine. Judy, do you want to? Oh, how? How? When Esau returned to me afterwards, he said to Father, Father, must Messiah. Meister means tithing. Must a person give tithing? <laughs> be taxed on soul. Isaac was amazed and thought to himself, Look how particular the son of mine is in this observation. I asked him, My son, where were you today? And he told him, I was in the house. Of so uh, Asa would specifically ask his. his all these, these Torah kind of righteous questions. Do I have to tithe from my salt? He would trick him with his mouth. So again, that follows the theme of the Abarbanel that Yaakov just didn't realize who Esav was. And perhaps had he realized, he would not have wanted to bless him. The reason why I find that difficult is, is I, I believe it was a, a holy individual who had a Ruach HaKodesh, a, a spiritual intuition, how could he not realize who his son was? Furthermore, the Torah specifically tells us that he um, both Rebecca, excuse me, yeah, and Yitzchak, Yitzchak and Rivka both had a lot of sadness, which means pain, from Asab's wives. It says that. It says, um, a lot of tsars. That's what it's his actual verse. And in fact, the Midrash writes when Asaph's uh, uh, when uh, I'm mixing up characters here. When Isaac's eyes were dim, text 10 a.m. Were too dim because of the smoke of these wives of these who had burned incense to the idols. <laughs> right. So they, they had chats for he knows who that Asaph's family is worshiping idols. So to say that he was completely oblivious to everything going on is surprising. There's another interesting thing that happens later on. Yeah, how? I think it's, it's easier to read that he didn't know, but I think you can also read that he absolutely did know. And he was working so hard to change Esau, and he was, he was blinding himself, not, I got to get out of my own way to help Esau. But I know who Esau is. I know who. And that's where we're going here. That's cool. That's a blessing too, because 
That's where we're going here. Absolutely. That's all these ideas where we're going. Yeah, please, and I'm just plugging this in. Yeah, Pam. I was just going to say, this kind of justifies why Rebecca had to do what she did, because he was so blinded with love, he knew everything that was going on, but he just kept hoping and hoping and hoping. She had to do what she had to do. Meaning that the chat is not of help, necessarily. No. Interesting. Just, Interesting. Um, but I mean, really, I, I just don't see the deception. I mean, that can't be holy. I mean, I, we're not supposed to lie. You know, this Shabbos, I want to discuss that a little bit more. I want to look more into it, and I, want, I do want to discuss the deception component here because it does seem very odd that something so holy, a brachas God, of this magnitude. But even God didn't say exactly what Sarah said to Abraham. So even God, the social lies, didn't say he says God changed the words not to hurt Abraham's feelings. That and there's something to be said about maybe not wanting to stay lush and hara about Asa. Not, not wanting Isaac to lose face in front of his sons and why she might have done what she did. Beautiful. Interesting. The other clue that Isaac knew who Asa was was when the time finally comes. And again, for those not familiar with the story, what happens? Rebecca says, I want you to get the blessings. I don't want you to fool your father. I want you to put on Jacob's hairy coat. And that way, your father will be fooled. And Jacob comes in, and he says, I'm here. And Yitzchak turns to him and says, wow, that was quick. And he answers. The verse says, God help me make this go fast. And the next verse is, come here, I want to feel you. Right? Was it the voice that gave it away? Why did he all of a sudden become suspicious? <laughs> Sarashi says, 10C. Why did he suddenly become suspicious after he answered God we do this very, very fast. Where are we up to in the reading? Can see. Can see. Please come closer and I may feel you, Isaac said to himself. Esau does not usually mention the name of heavenly frequency, but this one was the Lord your God prepared. It. It's like, oh, I'm thinking went very smooth today and I got the food right away. Huh? Your ace? So he was surprised when he heard the name of God coming out of his mouth Anybody and such. There? Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi, Debbie. Are you? Can I hear you? Anybody there? Yes. Oh. It's not oh. working for you her. Can, you can hear me? Yeah. I hear you. Can, can you hear me? Oh, wait a minute. I'm having a problem. I have to put off the uh, keep, sound. Keep okay, going. I did it. Okay, you can hear me now. Um, I kind of had um, things that I put in the chat. Uh, I don't know that I can hear you, but uh, it said that Rebecca had instructions from God. Rebecca was a higher in prophecy, and this is the reason she did not share the information with her husband, because if God had wanted him to know, then God would have told him directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the same way that Isaac was told about having children, um, you know, w one of them laughed, uh, one of them overheard. So there's ways that God actually wants the person to know. So that's why she didn't share. And also at the end of his life, his whole his whole thing was about deception and being blinded. Remember, remember that Esau was depressed when he gave away his birthright. You know, when you're depressed, you do anything. So um, at this point, his father was also depressed to find that in the end of his life, at the end of the story, when he had wanted so much for his two boys to come together and do fulfill their mission, uh, Esau having the material domain and Jacob Correct. the spiritual, that it wasn't working out. So he was depressed. So it seems as if, um, you know, when you're depressed, you can be blinded to a lot of things. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. What? Thank you, Debbie. It's nice to hear your voice. So what we're going to say here, we're, we're, we're short on time. We won't do all these texts here. But what do we know about Esau? He had tremendous avat, uh, uh, kibud avain. He respected his father in this tremendous way. We're going to have a text later on, um, text 14. I'm going to paraphrase some text here just to go fast. I served my father the, my entire life. I didn't even do 100th. 
of what Esav did for his father. He was magnificent when it came to respecting his father. That's number one. That there's a little bit more than Esau, to Esau, than this rotten individual. Hint number two is very interesting. There are more Geirim, more converts that come from Esau later in Jewish history than anyone else. Very interesting. The, the country of Rome descends from Esau. And some of the greatest sages were Roman converts. And if you look in the Midrash, the Midrash writes a whole list of sages that come. What am I getting at? That Esau had two sides to him, as you said. There was the soul, the good component of Esau, and there was the body and the animal list desires of Esau. He had both sides to him. A good parent sees the good in the child. Yitzchak focused on the good. It wasn't that he was oblivious to the bad, not at all. But he saw the good, he saw the potential. As many people here around the room said, he thought that by giving him extra attention, extra brachis, extra love, that will help bring that out. Yaakov was on the right path even without all of this. And therefore he felt this is the best way to access the internal good inside of Asa. The text that we're going to do now is, is an odd text. It's from a medrash. And if you don't take it literal, that's, that's fine. It's a message. And what is the text? Many years later, Jacob passes away. And Jacob is asked to be buried where? In Machpelah, in Hebron. He passes away. They carry his body all the way from Egypt to Israel. They're about to bury him in Machpela, and all of a sudden, who comes to the scene? A7 and his family. He says, uh uh, there's one spot left, very limited real estate. This spot is going to me. He goes, Yaakov already buried his wife here. He got half of it. I get the other half. And the Jewish people responded, No, that's not true. You sold your birthright, you sold your right to this last thing. He says, Show me the document. They say, We left it in Egypt. And they continue to fight back and forth. The fight breaks out. Asav is killed. Okay, this is a medrash. His head rolls off into, look at the way the word, he took a sword, struck Asav, his, 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 and I, I don't want to get into the, the, the violence and the literal meaning of this story. I want to get into the medrash, the, 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 the internal meaning of the story. Text 11. His head rolls off and rolls to the feet of Jacob. Let's do text 12. Okay. Who's reading? Judy, Judy. Judy. text 12. Yes. The unique connection between Esau and Isaac is demonstrated by the fact that Esau's head was buried in Isaac's bosom. The part of Esau that was wicked was his body, which was buried outside the cave, but his head was not. On the contrary, it gave him common ground with Isaac. Plus, his head came to rest. With Isaac. In other words, there were two parts. I, I want you to put aside the literal meaning of the story. Murder. Put that aside. The meaning is there is the head, there is the soul, there is the holy component of Esau, and there is the body and the animalistic. Yaakov's whole life was how. Yaakov's whole life was how can I bring out the good inside of my child? Okay. If you Jay, look at I'm, text I'm listening to the 15, um, lunch and learn. Marty. Text 15, Marty. Uh, whenever Esau was with Isaac, it was the good Isaac. Whenever Esau was with Isaac, it was the good Esau, the head part of Esau. As our sages said, I served my father my entire life, yet still I did not do for him even one hundredth of what Esau did for his father. It wasn't that he fooled his father. A lot of times, here's a, uh, this is an important point. A lot of times when someone does a lot of good and also a lot of bad, what does everyone say? They're a hypocrite, right? It must be that when they're doing the good, they don't really mean it. All they're, they're doing is fooling. I always say that's not necessarily true. We're complex people. You can have people that are, do a lot of mitzvahs, and guess what? They have an impulse. They have an inclination that gets to the better of them, and they do something rotten. You know? God forbid you hear these horrible scandals where a rabbi is caught doing something really bad, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the examples might be hypocrites. 
of these examples are good people that had a nasty addiction and they didn't get help when they should have and it got to the better of them. I'm not justifying it in any way. It's evil, evil, evil. What I am saying is that doesn't mean that all the good that they did was dismissed. They're a complex character. All of us have good and bad inside of us, but some are more polar. So whenever Esav was with Yitzchak, the good came out. That is who he saw. Why? Not because he was fooling his father, but because Yitzchak inspired the good of Esav to come out. Unfortunately, a lot of the rest of the time, the body of Esav came out. That was the dominant side of Esav. That came out most of his life. But that is why we see so many converts coming out of Esav. That is why we see his, his remarkable love of father, because he had that. And if there's one thing we know about I, uh, Yitzchak, I think I mentioned it two weeks ago in the Lunch and Learn, one of the things he did as an occupation in the Torah was a well digger. Remember you mentioned that? He dug wells. And what is the meaning of digging wells spiritually? <laughs> You access the hidden gold, the hidden water inside of a person. You don't just see the schmutz, the mud at the top, but you dig and dig and dig until you strike water. That was Yitzchak was, and he was able to access the water. Unfortunately, the rest of the time that didn't come out. And so we have this disagreement now on a deeper level between Rebecca and 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 um, and Yitzchak. So Rebecca's like that. That's all nice. It's all nice theoretically, but practically, you, know, you can't hand the keys to the 10-year-old saying, you know, one day you might be a driver. It's irresponsible right now to give this bracha to Esau unless we see him to practically make changes in his life right now. We can't reward him for the good behavior, and now the time is not right yet to give him the bracha. Yitzhak disagreed, but at least now we can understand the story in a very different sense. And the lesson for us, it's 12.30, is we need to be in our own life, whether it's a friend, whether it's a child, whether it's a loved one. We don't give up on anyone. I, I think I mentioned this story a few times, but Alan Dershowitz complained to the Rebbe that Chabad was honoring, and I always forget this fellow, he was a senator in North Carolina, Helms. Oh, Helms? Yes, he Helms. Helms. Jesse Helms. Chabad somewhere was honoring him for some purpose. <laughs> and Alan Dershowitz wrote a letter to the Rebbe saying, this guy you know, does not stand for so many values that we like, and most of all, his position towards Israel is not good. How could Chabad be honoring him? And the Rebbe says, wait, wait, maybe this will help bring out the good. And from what I understand, later he made a big, at least in his love for Israel and his support yeah, for Israel, right. and he did change in his life. Obviously, we have to be careful in this approach. There's sometimes where you can't reward bad behavior, but certainly when it comes to a loved one, when it comes to a child, we need to respond with love. If there's one thing the last generation has shown us is, you know, when it comes to, especially with, with Jews and Judaism, you know, when you don't agree necessarily with the approach a child has towards Yiddishkeit, what do you have to do? Love, love them more. Love them more. We need Isaacs in that regard. We've seen that the approach of not having any relationship with them, so on, and so, that that doesn't work. That doesn't work, and it doesn't mean it'll happen now. It doesn't mean it'll happen all the way. But when you show love and you show that I have this, this, and again, it doesn't mean that you necessarily agree with all the decisions. There, there can be a differentiation between agreeing with decisions and disagreeing with decisions, but having the love for the individual. It's a careful balance to have. But I see it so many times I speak to someone, oh, can I invite your child? Oh, don't give up on them, Rabbi. Never engage them in their Judaism. No, that's not, no, no. We have to look for points of entry. We have to find a way to access their neshama. Maybe the answer will be no, but at least they'll say a Jew is thinking about them. Maybe next year, maybe in five years. But we need to be Yitzchaks in that regard and not give up on our fellow people and love them. Hope that through the love, ultimately, the good will come out. Now, by the way, you can't just love them in order for the good to come out, right? That doesn't work either. Because that's not real love, that's conditional love. To love them because you love them. 
And then, when they see the genuine thing, we hope, we pray that will reciprocate the other way. Okay, questions, comments, yeah. I have a question about text to be, when it says here, will become mightier than the other kingdom, and, and they will not be equal in greatness. When one rises, the other will fall, that's text to be. Mm -hmm. what, what nation is that? Edom. It means Rome. It means the Rome. Oh. I think what's interesting is that, you know, I've been thinking about this um, senator who was, had an Alzheimer's daughter, who was a, just got from the Talmud, and I guess it was after the time of the Romans that seemed to have some relationship with the Romans, uh, that they said that you uh, have to follow the Gentiles' way of taking care of their parents, because they do such a good job. So the example given is the senator who, whose mother comes in and, and berates this very uh, responsible guy, and then all of a sudden she's throwing her shoe around, and she's hitting with the shoe, and then she drops it, and he's in the middle of the center, and all these public figures, mm -hmm. and he just picks up the shoe and hands it to his mother, and he treats her appropriately. So I was thinking about the genes, you know, these these went on to become Correct. Maybe there was a genetic how to be nice to your parents. Exactly. And, and what we're saying here is that was reflective not just in that area, but on a lot of internal good. And everyone has internal good. We have to access it. We have to bring it out. Um, the other, the, the other met, yeah. And if anyone has to go, I was going to say that the other perspective about Yaakov is that you know, he can sit in, in a yeshiva all day long and not have any knowledge of the ways of the world and be an effective leader. You have to have some ability to pull out the deceit and the negative qualities when it's to serve a good purpose. Correct, correct. And, and later he runs off to Laban's house and he works for a bunch of years and he learns that skill there. His but what his parents, would, I think what Rebecca, the, the real goal was that you can utilize both, right? The physicality of Asaph and the spirituality of Jacob and you make a perfect harmony between them. It didn't happen in their lifetime. But that is what has to happen Oh, there was that time where they yeah. embraced. You know what? Let me stand corrected. There is a beautiful moment of reconciliation. Right, because uh, Jacob is prepared for war. He says, I don't Correct. know what's going to happen here. And they end up <laughs> hugging and embracing, and that is a beautiful moment in the Torah. Right. And then right afterwards, Asaph says, hey, let's continue to hang out together. And Jacob says, no. And Jacob <laughs> says, we'll meet up at Seir. Guess what? They never end up meeting up in Seir. And the Talmud writes, when will that happen? It will happen in the times of Mashiach, that we'll have the perfect union between all the nations of the world. And that really is the concept of Mashiach, that every nation brings their quality. Every nation brings their gift, and we can work together to, to, to utilize everyone's gifts. But, but Asa has his gifts. But they were twins. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you would never think that twins would do anything but love each other. They would just be so <laughs> All of them fight the closer they are. Uh, yeah. There we go. I know I have twins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The tradition is that he was a redhead, so how could they be twins? Well, they were fraternal they twins. Were Oh, Not identical. Well, you know, they would have played together all of the time. I mean, I know things fall apart, but... <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think I've pointed this out before. There's, there's the reason why we have so much sibling rivalry in Genesis is this is really, uh, this I is the way of the world us a metaphor for nations of the world having to get together. But then we need to think about this with twins. I mean, twins are just close together. And I don't know enough about twins. Well, ask Brian. He has twins. I'm a twin. Debbie, any oh, last no, comments from anyone twins. in the online community or Debbie? Twins. Yeah. And no. Um, it was a good, good talk. Very good. All right. I'm happy you're able to join. Uh, yeah, in the, in the beginning when we were younger. Yeah, no, no. Because it stole an opposite personality. It's funny, there's a, there's a uh, book hey, called, like, The 60-Minute Manager. It says that the, the manager should do is follow he could, he the people around the work for him to no. find something to yeah, praise them. There we go. So that's basically the same concept, right find something good. Right, and then right? use, and it's not, hmm. and then yeah, I guess you use that as entranceway. Right, to, to help them improve, right. But again, this is with children. I mean, you know, when you're able to highlight the good things that they do, right, and you praise them on the good qualities, you hope that by focusing on that, that will allow the other good to come inside as well. 
or just say, you know what, well, I only recognize the good in you. Yeah, because there's what happens is if if ninety eight percent is good and two percent is bad, you focus on the two percent that's bad, right? Right. That's right. true with kids. With, right. with anyone. Well, and not yeah. that you bring in it world. up ten years from now. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. The two percent. Right? Exactly. I remember. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, from joining in from online. We will, God willing, be same place, same time <laughs> next week. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVBI members, the Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet, with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net.